And uh, folks on the margins, of course, are only hopeful that uh, folks will pay attention, you know. And uh, once I had a very earnest 16-year-old gang member stand in front of my desk, and he said, look, I need your divided attention. <laughs> I said, well, you are in luck, because uh, that is exactly what you'll be getting. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm an expert on nothing, but I've worked with Film. gang members for uh, 30 years, so apparently the organizers of this event thought that made me eminently suited to uh, address you this morning, so uh, you can take that up with them. Uh, so, uh, it's been the privilege of my life uh, to know thousands and thousands of gang members. They taught me everything uh, of value, and I, the day won't ever come when I am more noble or I have more courage, or I'm closer to God uh, than these men and women. Uh, people like uh, Hector. Uh, Hector, 17 years old, back in school, uh, in our school, and working part-time at Homeboy. And, uh, I think he's starting to discover, after being gone from school for so long, that you know he's a pretty smart guy. So he was in my office, and he was kind of trying his hand at small talk, and he was saying, oh, by the way, I ran into a man who attended one of your talks once. I said, really? He goes, yes. He found your talk rather monotonous. <laughs> oh, God, seriously? Well, no, actually, that didn't happen, but I need practice using bigger words. <laughs> so I asked him kindly to practice on somebody else. If he wanted to or people like Luis Perez, who uh, is kind of running the place uh, while I'm gone, along with a handful of other homies. A gang member, felon, shot caller, tattooed, been to prison, uh, and now he kind of uh, is in charge of personnel, which is, you know, he's kind of a big deal. And uh, he also gives talks, you know, uh, actually uh, he's come up with me to, to Canada uh, a couple times, and he's a good speaker. And uh, Well, we went out to dinner not long ago, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly, and he said, you know, you have to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> I said, yeah, no shit. <laughs> no. That's good advice there. So brace yourselves. Um, so, so how do we connect uh, kind of our two lives together? You know, I, I think we're all called to, uh, to do you know, a particular thing, you know, and we want to somehow participate in God's dream becoming true. And so we want the world to look differently than it currently looks. It's part of our mission and our vision. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. Uh, but, uh, Encouraged by our uh, current Pope, you know, none of us want to wait for too long, you know, with our arms crossed, tapping our feet, staring at our watches, wanting to wait for something to happen. We want to make something happen. Mother Teresa, I think, diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we imagine a, a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. How do we dismantle the barriers that exclude? How do we inch our way out to the margins, as the Pope calls us, to stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, to stand with those whose dignity has been denied, to stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear, and indeed to stand with the easily despised, the readily left out, choose to stand at the margins because if you stand there, the margins get erased because of that decision. And you stand indeed with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And you stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. We do this uh, not on our own, but because we know that that's God's dream come true. And so it's pretty essential to uh, know what kind of God we have. If we're not careful, our God 
and our sense of God will atrophy. Uh, the truth is, uh, we're supposed to outgrow our God practically every day because as St. Ignatius of Loyola uh, tells us, uh, our God uh, is the God who's always greater, greater than our notion. Uh, our God is greater uh, than the God we think we have. Uh, a Jesuit said to me once, we need a better God than the one we have, which is of course true. Why would that alarm us? Uh, the mystery and the secret of the ministry of Jesus was that God was at the center of it. So what kind of God do we have? Uh, the truth is, uh, we sometimes project onto God uh, ourselves, you know, and, and that's how you know that God is not like that, because it's what I would do if I was God. Uh, Anne Lamont, the writer, says, you know you've created God in your own image when suddenly God hates all the same people you do, you know, and, <laughs> and, and so it, you want to avoid the tiny, puny, atrophying God and somehow every day move towards the spaciousness and this expanse of God, this God who is, uh, who loves us without measure and without regret, this God who's too busy loving us to have any time left for anything else, much less disappointment. The truth be told, uh, um, our God is too good to be true, and as human beings, whenever we bump into something we think is too good to be true, we decide it's not true. And our God is larger than we could ever ask or imagine. Uh, in the uh, United States, uh, Yogi Berra died, and he was famous for <laughs> misspeaking, and the homies are just as bad at this, and uh, they're always kind of uh, uh, mangling the English language in a very charming way. I had a homegirl named Lisa come into my office, and she was introducing her man to me, and she said, this is my sufficient other. <laughs> No doubt. Uh, you know, I'm traveling a lot and giving a lot of talks, but it's a good thing because I have a CEO, this guy named Tom Volso, who's taken over. It's an $18 million annual operation. I'm happy not to worry about cash flow and budget. So he handles all that. And I had a homie in my office not long ago, and he said, uh, damn, gee, my lady, she's in a bad mood today. And I said, why? Well, you know, she's beginning her administration period. <laughs> I said, well, I'm just ending mine, so uh, kind of know what she's uh, going through. <laughs> but my favorite one happened when I was presiding at Mass at San Fernando Juvenile Hall, a huge gym and had about 300 kids in it, mainly gang members. And so I was vested, sitting in a chair, and they were doing the readings, and I had this little sheet, you know, that was in English and Spanish. Uh, for a lot of bilingual, or kids who only speak Spanish as well, and, and my mass is bilingual, but, but I thought, you know, you do this as a presider rather than, you know, a reading the readings. You, you close your eyes and you listen. So, I'm, so I have the sheet on my lap and I'm listening to, a, a homie got up and did, you know, like the psalm or something, and, and with a kind of an overabundance of confidence, and he said, the Lord is exhausted. <laughs> And I said, what the hell? And I look at the sheet and it says, the Lord is exalted. And I just remember thinking at the time, wow, that's way better. I mean, think about it. I'd much rather have an exhausted God. Because exalted is up there, way elevated, lifted so high, I, you know, where the heck? When God, everybody knows that God wants to be close and intimate and whispering in our ear, and God is exhausted and loving us. You know, it's like that experience you have when people say, how are you feeling? Ooh, I'm, I'm exhausted. But it's a good tired. Have you ever said that? Well, why? Well, you know, I helped a friend move into an apartment this week. And oh, I had the grandkids this weekend. Whatever it is, it's a good tired because it's that feeling of, of being extensive with another and finding your true self in that love. I, boy, it's way better a God who's just exhausted loving us. Too busy to be disappointed. It's important to reclaim the kind of God who's spacious and expansive. Otherwise, it won't make any sense to go to the margins. 
What we want to connect to always in what we do is God's dream come true. That we be one. How do we get to that place? And so we're called to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it so that God can nod and say, yeah, that's, that's my dream come true. And the truth is, if kinship happened to be our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We'd be celebrating it. There are all sorts of things we want to reach, goals, you know, peace, justice, equality, the end of racism. But the truth is, none of those things can happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we belong to each other. No kinship, no peace. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no equality. No matter how focused we may well be on those singularly important goals, they actually can't happen unless there's some undergirding sense of kinship, that we are connected to each other, that we belong to each other. So homies have taught me so much uh, in the course of my 30 years working with them, and, and again, I, it's just a, a wealth and storehouse of wisdom for which I am indeed grateful. But in the last couple of years, they've taught me how to text, so I'm so grateful to them. <laughs> been waking up a few homies this morning since there's a three hour difference, but uh, I'm texting, you know, I'm pretty good at it, LOL and OMG and BTW, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh hell no. <laughs> and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. <laughs> I, I know I can't be the only one vexed by uh, the stupid uh, autocorrect. I mean, good lord. I was, um, uh, one Sunday, a homegirl named Bertha texted me, where are you at? And I said, I'm about to speak to a room full of moncas, and moncas is Spanish for nuns, sisters, religious women. I'm about to speak to a room full of moncas. I pushed sin. Autocorrect told her that I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas. <laughs> which she thought was, you know, pretty interesting. <laughs> the worst one is homies are always, even from this distance in Toronto, their, their hair is always on fire, and oh my gosh, and uh, they're going to cut off my lights, and I need this much to finish my rent. Always, always, always. I'm the priest they mistook for an ATM machine. But, uh, <laughs> so I had a homie who needed help with his rent, I just didn't have any money, so I wrote, things are tight, and I pushed send, and autocorrect told him, Thongs are tied. <laughs> and he wrote back, sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, what about my rent? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, one day I'm, I'm going to go speak to Still a high me. school and I bring two homies with you, Manuel and, and Boncho. They're older vatos who have been uh, doing a variety of things at Homeboy and, and we have our morning meeting and then at 9 o'clock we get in the car to drive to Palm Springs, which is about two hours. And, um, and Manuel's in the front seat and so while we're driving, Manuel gets an incoming text and uh, he reads it to himself and he chuckles and, and I said, well, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb. It's, from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I had just seen Snoopy. Snoopy, you know, gave me a big abrazote as the day was beginning. And, and Snoopy and Manuel worked together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds of our workers, which is really kind of a hard job because this may come as a surprise to you, but gang members can occasionally be attitudinal. <laughs> so I said, well, what's he say? And he goes, oh, it's dumb. Um, hang on. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, I almost drove in oncoming traffic and laughed so hard. And, and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other, because I remember. Now they shoot text messages to me. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? 
how do we bridge uh, the daylight that exists between us? And there is daylight always, even, even in our service. You know, uh, we have to go beyond service. You know, service is the hallway that got you to this ballroom. You want to get to the ballroom, which is the place of kinship, the place of connection, the place of exquisite mutuality. The ocean does it suddenly. It's very soothing, actually. Um, so that the uh, there is a distance sometimes. You know, service provider, service recipient. Um, you know, teacher, student. There, there's a distance. You know, and. And some of it is appropriate, but some of it is you want to kind of somehow arrive at some mutuality, and, and that's the goal. Uh, at Homeboy Industries, I'm not the great healer, and that gang member over there is in need of my exquisite healing. The truth be told, we're all in need of healing. We're all a cry for help. It's one of the things that joins us together as members of the human family. And, and it's nice to arrive at that. Um, do, do people here know who Sesak Chavez is? Caesar Chavez. Yeah, he was the uh, organizer, uh, yeah, yeah. hero in the Latino community in the United States, uh, the organizer of the uh, farm workers. And uh, he, it was a privilege of my life to call him a friend, and, he, uh, and, and I knew him, and he was uh, always uh, uh, the best listener I've ever known in my life. If you were talking to Cesar, it, it, you were the only person that he focused on. It was laser beam. He was never looking over your shoulder to see if somebody more important was on the approach. It was extraordinary. But quite famously, once a reporter had commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual, which of course is the hope. How do we arrive at this mutuality where there is no daylight that separates us in service. There is no distance. How do we obliterate the illusion that we are separate? Uh, no homie ever found more job opportunities than a kid named, uh, we all call him Dreamer. And I knew him as a little kid growing up in the housing projects and big family, very poor, got into trouble, got into a gang. A uh, very smart kid, though I don't remember that school ever figured too much in his life. I mean, but singularly intelligent, and uh, I always enjoyed his very dangerous sense of humor. Uh, he's about 40 now, but in his early 20s, he was kind of a yo-yo, in and out of getting locked up. So I'd find him a job, sometimes in the private sector, sometimes in, the, uh, in one of our social enterprises, our businesses. And so, uh, but he'd be back and forth in jail, you know, he'd always sort of gravitate back to vague criminality, usually something involving drugs, the sale of or the use of, and then he'd wander back to me. And it, this was a pattern that went on quite a bit. And so this one time he finished a, a four month uh, stretch of probation violation in county jail, and there he is sitting in front of my desk, and, and he says what gang members often say, this time it'll be different, and I go, hmm, all right. So with him sitting there, I call a friend of mine who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California, a guy named Gary. And Gary had hired homies in the past, so I'm thinking maybe he'll do it again. And, and sure enough, he says, yeah, you'll tell him he can start tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began work the next day and uh, at the vending machine company. Well, two weeks later, there he is sitting in front of my desk. I go, you are kidding me, equally. Madre Santa, I can't believe you're back here. And, but this time he pulls out of his pocket his very first paycheck and he waves it proudly. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I, is there anything that can be done about this? I don't know what it is, but it's, if it's annoying me, I'm gonna presume it annoys you. <laughs> Do you think that's it? You think? Also, the other thing is that it may be too, the power may be too uh, for a thing, but anyway, that's fine. It's the same. So, um, the, uh, <laughs> sometimes if it's on too high, which is to say the mic is too hot, but we don't have anybody here who knows where the master switch is. 
Yeah, but if the master power goes down a little bit, I will. I don't know. Anyway, so where the heck was I? So the dreamer comes in. He says, "This paycheck makes me feel proper," and he says, "My mom is proud of me, and my kids aren't ashamed of me." And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, "Well, gosh, you know, who?" And he looked at me strangely, and he said, well, God, of course. I said, oh, yes, no. That's like, no. <laughs> that would be God, yeah. <laughs> you thought I was going to say you. I said, no, God. <laughs> God's number one. <laughs> you are so lucky you're not living in them Genesis days. And I'm sorry, is that them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> well, I guess he told me, but the, all I remember was that the two of us dissolved in laughter and we fell out of our chairs. And I defy you to identify exactly who's the service provider and who's the service recipient. It's mutual. That's perfect, thanks. Uh, so let me just give you, tell you a little bit about Homeboy, uh, though it was mentioned somewhat in the, in the uh, introduction. Uh, Homeboy was born during the time I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, uh, Dolores Mission, and it was nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. At the time, it was the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi, and we had eight gangs at war with each other, which was uh, not typical, actually. Uh, you would usually have one gang per project, but we had eight, and all of them were at war with each other. Uh, and I buried my first young person killed in 1988, and I'll bury my 203rd when I return home. Not all of them from that community, but I run a very large gang intervention program. I get asked to do this. So my parish, when I arrived, according to the LAPD, was the largest at the highest concentration of gang activity anywhere in the whole city was my parish. I didn't know this. So the first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school and nobody wanted them. So they were wreaking havoc and violent and selling drugs and writing on the wall. So I, I, I walked out to them in the projects and I would isolate them a little bit and I I'd kind of take them apart from the group, and I'd say, uh, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, every single gang member said, yeah, I would. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them, you know, so it kind of forced my hand. So right across the street from the church is our parochial school, our elementary school, uh, K to 8. And that's the first two floors. The entire third floor, though, was the convent, you know, where the ninjas live. <laughs> and so I went up there and I gathered all the nuns in the living room and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind moving out? And, <laughs> and we could turn the, you know, the convent into a school for gang members. And they said, sure. <laughs> So we were off and running, and uh, this brought gang members in large numbers to the church, not to services, but to the church property, and which kind of upset the apple cart because uh, uh, people started to grumble and say, you know, they thought, uh, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out. And so that was a good challenge, a gospel challenge, if you will. And... Uh, and then the gang member said, if only we had jobs, so myself and the women, uh, mainly women with children, uh, populated the projects. Myself and the women, we marched around the factories that surrounded the housing projects, trying to find felony-friendly employers, you know, and that wasn't so forthcoming. So we started to invent things, you know, different kinds of crews, uh, a graffiti removal crew, a landscaping crew, a maintenance crew a crew to build our child care center. And then in 1992 um, uh, was the unrest in Los Angeles, and it was just huge, having grown up in the, uh, during the Watts riots, this, there was nothing that could compare to 92. It was after the Rodney King beating and the verdict and uh, the 
the whole city exploded. But because we were the poorest community in the whole city, the people expected us to explode, and we didn't. So the LA Times uh, interviewed me and asked me, how come this community didn't uh, ignite? And so I said, I think it's because we had 60 strategically hired gang members uh, who were enemies, rivals, working together. And they had a reason to get up in the morning, and more importantly, a reason not to ignite this place at night. I think that's why they were invested. And they were probably the actors most likely to ignite something. So a movie producer...